Happy Saturday, everybody. Today we are picking up where we left off in our two-parter on Gertrude Bell. This two-parter originally came out in 2012, and it was the work of previous hosts Sarah and Dublina. And today's installment gets into the work that Bell did that influenced the founding of modern Iraq. So enjoy! Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class from HowStuffWorks.com. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Dublina Chakraborty. And I'm Sarah Dowdy. And we're continuing on here with our discussion of Gertrude Bell, who is a British archaeologist, mountain climber, and desert explorer. And as we'll see in this episode, also an intelligence officer and a diplomat, too. She's said to have been one of the most powerful women in the British Empire at one time. But today, her name really isn't that widely known. So we wanted to take a look at her life and why she was called the uncrowned queen of Iraq. So let's recap just a little bit before we get too far into this. In part one of this podcast, we talked a bit about Gertrude's scholarly pursuits, plus some of her daredevil adventures as a young woman climbing the Alps. We followed her on some of her early adventures through the Middle East during times when she explored areas that no woman, in many cases nobody at all, had ever explored before, places that were considered extremely dangerous. Uh, One of the most exciting of these adventures was when she explored the territory of the secretive Druze sect and charmed the Druze king. And in these cases, and I mean especially with that example, it was her brave and her charm that really seemed to pay off, really seemed to win over the locals. And in doing so, by by becoming so friendly with the people she met, she was really able to learn a lot about the area and its history, things that really were not previously known by foreigners. It also helped her with her various archaeological pursuits, though, too, which we outlined a bit in the last episode. And we also discussed her first meeting with Thomas Edward Lawrence, better known as Lawrence of Arabia. And we haven't seen the last of him. He's going to pop up again in Gertrude Bell's story. So stay tuned for that. But although she didn't necessarily think this of all women, Gertrude also obviously believed herself capable of many things. But as we'll see in this episode, there were some instances in which people were ready to challenge that. Before that, though, we should really dwell on this idea of Bell being capable of anything that I just mentioned for just for a second, because it certainly seemed like she was when it came to most pursuits. But we do know that up to this point in our story, she hasn't been able to sort things out in her personal life really that well, especially in the marriage department, even though it would have been expected of a woman with her background to have worked that out early on. So we talked about her first love a little bit in that first episode. It was a young British diplomat named Henry Cadogan, whom Bell's father didn't approve of because he just didn't have the Financial money. resources. Exactly, the financial means to take care of her. And he actually passed away soon after their courtship, closing that door for good for her. But somehow, in the midst of all these adventures and scholarly pursuits, Gertrude did manage to find love again. I mean, she sounds kind of like she's our sitcom heroine we're talking about right now. But she she did find a second love when she was in her 40s. She'd come across the British diplomat and army officer Richard Doty Wiley while traveling in Turkey, where he'd been stationed. And when the two of them were back in London for a time in 1913, they really clicked finally. They started up an affair. And of course, According to Janet Wallach's article in the Smithsonian, they apparently had a lot of passion between them, at least early on. They had a lot in common. They were both adventurers, but their relationship didn't last very long. It flamed out pretty quickly. For one thing, Dodie Wiley was married, and he also got reassigned. He was reassigned to the Balkans. And after that, Gertrude just really threw herself into another great adventure, this time going to the desert of northern Arabia, where no Westerner had traveled in 20 years. So really uh, looking for something new to do after this this second flame. Right. And not only was this area not well-traveled, I mean, just to give an idea of how dangerous it really was, there were two tribes in the area that were – they had a brutal war going on between them at the time. So, so it's dangerous. Exactly. And the British, because of that, advised her not to go. And she also didn't have permission from the Turks to travel there, but she did it anyway. She went ahead and and set off on this journey. And she reached her goal of making it to Ha'il, which is a walled city, which was once a stop for pilgrims en route to Mecca. But 
Among other misadventures, she ended up during this journey being held captive by a powerful tribe there for nearly 10 days. And you can imagine during this time, she really thought she wasn't going to get away. The tribe apparently had quite the reputation for, for murder and mayhem. So she she just feared for her life, really. But finally, her anger just sort of overcame her fear, I guess, <laughs> and she demanded that they set her free. And surprisingly, they did, not really sure why they did that. Maybe they were just really shocked and impressed she she spoke up for herself. I don't know. It's Maybe the opposite they were of, of charm. It's sometimes effective, it seems. True. But, um, by the summer of 1914, she was back in England. And uh, you might think she'd be relieved to be home and be safe and be alive. But she was feeling kind of down, feeling a, a letdown that you might feel after a particularly exhilarating trip, or in her case, a life-threatening trip. According to Wallach's article, she wrote to Dodie Wiley at this time and, and said, the end of an adventure always leaves one with a feeling of disillusion, just nothing. And she went on to say, dust and ashes in one's hand, dead bones that look as if they would never rise and dance. So she's feeling poetic, but also clearly sad about where she is. She needs, this is a woman who needs something to do. So in 1914, she was kind of presented with some new possibilities. In June of that year, Archduke Franz Ferdinand, who was heir to the throne of Austria-Hungary, was assassinated, which helped set World War I into motion. And the Turks entered into a secret treaty with the Germans, and they became allies. So suddenly, Gertrude's singular knowledge of the Arabian Desert and its people became really invaluable to the British because they wanted to keep their influence in the Middle East. She'd explored, as we mentioned, and mapped places that most Westerners had never been. So what she knew was then a hot commodity. It was. And according to Carrie Ellis's History Today article, the British director of military operations in Cairo did ask Bell to get him a report, including basically everything that she had ever learned on her travels in Syria and Mesopotamia and Arabia. And she had, you know, she she hadn't just observed all this time. She had formed some opinions of her own, too. And clearly, with the world so in balance at this point, she was ready to, to speak her mind. Right. She believed in a strategy of organizing the Arabs in a revolt against the Ottoman Turks because she knew that the Ottomans were losing their influence with the Arabs. And so she shared her knowledge of this, but she wanted to go beyond that. She really thought that she could help with this, with organizing this revolt. And so she asked for an official post in the Middle East, but she was denied that because it was thought to be too dangerous for a woman. So she went off to France for a while to volunteer with the Red Cross. Probably also pretty dangerous, right? Right. (laughs) By November of 1915, though, the military had had a bit of a change of heart, and Gertrude was called to the Arab Bureau in Cairo to work for a small espionage team that they had there in the Savoy Hotel. There were a couple of other archaeologists working for this little intelligence outfit, too, including Leonard Woolley, who we mentioned recently, I think, in the Agatha Christie podcast, Mm -hmm. and also Lawrence. And they were making maps and geological reports, and Gertrude was drafted to catalog Arab tribes, which she had learned a lot about on her travels. So she was cataloging these tribes in detail so that British officials could reach out to their leaders and form alliances. And just incidentally, you just mentioned Lawrence again. This is where he and Gertrude Bell got to be really good friends, really tight. They'd share meals together. They would talk all the time. In uh, her article, Wallach even calls them, quote, soulmates. So good buddies. Uh, But the work that Gertrude was doing during this time, while clearly very valuable to the British, still wasn't really in an official capacity. It was vital. It was increasingly influential, but it wasn't official. Just some examples, though, of the kind of stuff she was doing. She was sent to India to convince the viceroy there to put up men and cash in support of the Arab revolt. In March of 1916, she was sent to Mesopotamia to use her relationships with various tribes there to try to convince locals to cooperate with the British effort. So she's really on the ground, getting people involved, stirring up British loyalties. Um, And then her maps, too. I mean, that's just a very practical side of things. Her maps really helped the British army reach Baghdad. 
So as a result of all these contributions, her work in Mesopotamia under the leadership of Chief Political Officer Percy Cox, Gertrude was given the title of Liaison Officer Correspondent to Cairo, which made her official and, according to Ellis, made her the sole female political officer in the British forces. And then in 1917, after the British Army took Baghdad, she was given the title of Oriental Secretary. By late 1918, things changed, though. The Allies had made peace with Germany, and the Ottoman Empire had collapsed. The Arab world was pretty much in a total state of chaos as France and England tried to figure out how they were going to divvy up their sphere of influence in the Middle East. And there was also the question of how these areas were going to be governed. For example, would the areas under British influence, which at the time included Mesopotamia, would these be under British rule or would they be allowed to govern themselves? And of course, as you can imagine, Bell had an opinion on this. In January of 1919, she was asked for a report that addressed this very question, uh, which was a task that she was understandably quite passionate about, having known the people and and studied and worked with them for so long. And according to Ellis's article, it took her 10 months to put something together, though. She was so thorough on it. And the idea that it ultimately got across her report was her belief that the Arabs should be able to govern themselves. She wrote, quote, an Arab state in Mesopotamia within a short period of years is a possibility in the recognition or creation of a logical scheme of government on those lines in supersession of those on which we are now working on Mesopotamia would be practical and popular. So very report kind of language there, but clear what her what her view on, on the situation is. Unfortunately, though, her superior at the time, A.T. Wilson, because Cox had been called away to another post, Wilson didn't agree with her at all on this point. He sent her report over with a cover letter that expressed how he felt her ideas were, quote, erroneous. So Wilson basically believed that the British should retain control there. And He wasn't, incidentally, the only British officer in Baghdad that Bell didn't get along with. In general, she was pretty much disliked by her peers in those post-war years. According to Wallach's article, colleagues expressed this in a number of different ways. For example, they would keep her out of the loop on cables and secret documents, uh, maybe on a lighter note, maybe not as serious. They would shun her in the dining hall. They would make jokes about her and laugh behind her back. So just an example here, she used to throw these tease for British and Arab dignitaries to get together and sort of get to know each other a little better. And the other officers referred to them mockingly as PSAs, which stood for Pleasant Sunday Afternoons. They also referred to her house as Chastity Chase, which is pretty mean. It is pretty mean. I mean, all of the the shunning her in the dining mess, that's pretty mean, pretty childish. And uh, we certainly don't want to make it sound as if she invited this kind of behavior because it just sounds like mean stuff to do. But in some cases, she may have encouraged it a little bit. Uh, With the officers' wives especially, she was quite rude to them. She would make pointed remarks about what they wore, you know, if they were wearing things that she didn't consider very culturally appropriate, like a low-cut dress. um, she She would call them out on it. She even said about that, quote, I do wish that our women would show some suitability in attire. Um, but, but basically, she didn't do anything to try to be friendly to most of the people she worked with. So meanwhile, 18 months after the Ottoman Empire collapsed, there still wasn't an Arab government in place in Mesopotamia, and the British were still in control. So the Arab tribes rebelled. Wilson basically tried to squash this uprising with brute force, bombs, and, and the like, but This only made things worse. 10,000 Arabs lost their lives during this time, and a few hundred British did as well. Things changed, though, by October 11th, 1920. By then, Wilson had been forced out, and Bell's old friend Percy Cox returned. He shared her view that the Arabs should govern themselves, so this helped to kind of set things in motion. Well, it also coincided nicely with the fact that the then colonial secretary, Winston Churchill, was ready to put a stop to the enormous economic drain of these Arab rebellions. They were quite expensive. So he called his best experts on the Middle East together to a conference in Egypt to figure out how exactly they were going to make this new Arab government work. He invited 40 experts total 
Only one woman was there, Gertrude, of course. Her old buddy Lawrence was in attendance as well. And Wallach describes her showing up in Cairo in her signature accessories, which were a a hat and furs and really getting right down to business. She helped determine the borders of the new nation of Iraq. And the real tricky part, though, was figuring out not where the country would be, where its borders would be, but who is going to lead this new nation. Yeah, because there were so many different groups to consider, just to name a few, the Shiites, the Sunnis, the Kurds, uh, the Jewish community as well. Who could they find? This was the question. Who could they find who would be accepted by all of these people? So they finally decided on making the Naqib, the Sunni holy man of Baghdad, the prime minister. And for that king position that was so key, they thought of Prince Faisal, whose family was said to be descendants of the Prophet Muhammad. Because of that connection, he'd appeal to both the Shiites and the Sunni Muslims, but he also had military and administrative experience that he'd proven during the war and during the rebellion. Both Bell and Lawrence argued heavily in his favor. They wanted Faisal as king. And they convinced Churchill, too. But of course, the real test was going to be whether they could convince the Iraqi people. Uh, One major problem was that Faisal didn't have any roots in Iraq. He had never even been to the, the... future country before. And according to Ellis, he even spoke a different dialect of Arabic. So he really had a lot to learn. But the Arabs didn't want a ruler who was just so obviously a puppet of the British. So it wasn't just about him learning things. It was coming across authentic almost. So after he arrived in Baghdad, Gertrude really took him under her her wing. And again, she used her vast knowledge of the region to help bring him up to speed, you know, helping him learn about the different tribes and tribal geography, teaching him little things like how to deal with businessmen in Baghdad, and using her influence with tribal leaders to, to win them over. I mean, it's kind of ironic when you think about it, if this British woman is training this man to be king and and helping him really be authentic by sharing all of her knowledge. But it, it seemed to work well. She and Faisal ultimately became good friends. It took a few months, but Faisal did win the widespread support of the Iraqis, and he won the throne by a virtually unanimous vote. He was crowned king on August 23, 1921, and after he took the throne, Gertrude remained one of his closest advisors, both personally and politically, for, for some time. And that's how she became known in England and in Baghdad as the uncrowned queen of Iraq. So, of course... This whole process was a huge thrill for Gertrude. I mean, nation building and and being almost the personal tutor for the king. Uh, She wrote home at one point, quote, I feel at times like the creator about the middle of the week. He must have wondered what it was going to be like as I do. I think that's kind of a little nod to some of the earlier notes we made about Gertrude being quite confident (laughs) in herself. Um, But as Iraq's government strengthened under its new leadership, Wallach writes that Bell became more of a social secretary to Faisal than anything else. He he had learned what he needed to, to function. Also, uh, Percy Cox retired, so her duties there were sort of diminished in general, uh, phasing out a little bit at this point. For a while, she went back into her roots in archaeology just kind of to have something to do because she was a little bit bored. She went to the Sumerian city of Uruk and found all of these relics. And with Faisal's permission, she founded the country's first museum of antiquities, temporarily housed in the palace at Baghdad. And that became her focus for a while. She would supervise digs and she would save and catalog these treasures of ancient Iraq that she found. In June of 1926, her archaeological museum officially opened with a collection of more than 3,000 items. Still, though, and and despite that accomplishment, I mean, opening a museum, Gertrude still felt really depressed and lonely and had become increasingly so in the years leading up to to this point. She had lost a lot of her influence in, in Baghdad, as we mentioned, and also many of her friends had left by this point, too. Her health had deteriorated, her family fortune had dwindled, and they lost their home in England. Her, her brother died, and she really regretted, too, not having uh, married earlier and having a family of her own, something 
something she she was upset about. So most people seem to believe that it's this combination of reasons uh, that on Sunday, July 11th, 1926, she went to bed and purposely took an extra dose of sleeping pills. She never woke up, uh, but it, it is good to know that she was at least fully honored in death. She was given a full military funeral by the British in Baghdad. She was buried there, which seems quite fitting because at one point she even wrote, quote, I don't care to be in London much. I like Baghdad and I like Iraq. It's the real East and it's stirring. Things are happening here and the romance of it all touches me and absorbs me. Uh, so clearly she considered this her home and where she wanted to be. And others there seem to have connected with her as well. Arabs apparently lined the streets to say goodbye to her. And her influence was felt there for a while. The regime that she helped establish with Faisal was in power for 37 years before it finally fell to revolutionaries. Again, just really interesting, especially because of the way Iraq has made headlines in recent years that Gertrude's name isn't more widely known, but it may be more widely known soon. Rumors of a movie project uh, have been kind of swirling around for a while. Mm -hmm. One rumor, I think, connected a Ridley Scott idea to Angelina Jolie, who would have played Gertrude Bell. But I don't know. I think maybe that has fizzled out a little bit. But there's a more recent rumor also involving Jude Law, Robert Pattinson, and Naomi Watts as Gertrude Bell that's set to begin filming, I think, in 2013. That may be more than a rumor. That may, so, that may be. I mean, we'll see. I yeah. guess we'll know soon enough, won't we? It certainly seems like good movie material. Um, I, I think it is funny. I mean, you were just mentioning it's strange she hasn't made, uh, I don't know, made more news or been connected to more news stories or her name just isn't that widely known. I always have thought of her as one of the lady travelers, but clearly there's so much more going on. There's a lot more I think to her than just that. Lady traveler is, is probably not a great <laughs> <laughs> uh, category to put her in. Um, nation builder, you know, something like that. So many things, yeah. <laughs> And I still love that mountain climber aspect of her personality, too. Yeah, it's she, easy to forget with all this other stuff. But yeah, that she has this stint in her youth climbing the Alps. And a mountain that's named after her. Yeah, G Gertrude Spitzer or something. Mm -hmm. um, pretty, pretty great all around. So um, very interesting to learn about her. I'm glad that we now know the bigger picture. And I think it'll certainly inform just how I see current events, too. I mean, this is fairly recent history. It's not that long ago. It's still pretty applicable in certain ways. Absolutely. I love how these podcasts kind of, they give us more knowledge about how the world sort of came to its present state, and we learn a lot more about, about different areas. Thank you so much for joining us for this Saturday Classic. Since this is out of the archive, if you heard an email address or a Facebook URL or something similar during the course of the show, that may be obsolete now. So here is our current contact information. We are at History Podcast at HowStuffWorks.com, and then we're at Missed in History all over social media. That is our name on Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr, Pinterest, and Instagram. Thanks again for listening. For more on this and thousands of other topics, visit HowStuffWorks.com.